Welcome to Question Time. Tonight we're in Stoke-on-Trent on tonight's panel. Chris Philp, the government's Minister for Tech and the Digital Economy, previously Justice Minister and a businessman before becoming elected as an MP. Until last month's reshuffle, Labour's shadow foreign secretary, now shadowing Michael Gove at the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities, Lisa Nandy. One of the SNP's longest serving MPs and former deputy leader of the party, Stuart Hosey. Olivia Utley, journalist and assistant comment editor at the Daily Telegraph and chief executive of NHS providers representing a wide range of health and NHS services in England, Chris Hobson. Welcome to my panel. Welcome to our audience here in Stoke-on-Trent, all masked up. It is a first on Question Time, but it is a sign of the times. Thank you very much for coming and being part of the programme. And of course, thank you to you at home for watching. Do join in the conversation in the usual way on social media at BBC Question Time, and we'll hear what you've got to say. OK, our first question tonight is from Ashik Ali. With the rising number of COVID infections and severe pressures on the NHS, is another lockdown inevitable? Lisa. I don't think it's inevitable. I don't think it's been inevitable. But there have certainly been warnings for some considerable time that if we didn't take the action necessary, then that's where we would end up. That's why we've been saying to the government for months now, we need to accelerate the booster programme. We need to get people out of retirement. We need to set up pop-up clinics around the country to get the booster programme rolled out, to get jabs to young people so we don't have pick young people out of school again, like we saw last year. And we've got to make sure that we do everything that it takes in order to keep things open and keep things moving. But in terms of the restrictions, you're not suggesting anything differently, are you? We've, well, we've been saying for months now that Plan A should have included mask wearing in crowded spaces because we could see, like everybody else, like many of the government scientists, that COVID rates were rising across the country. And we were being told a year ago that it was only a matter of time before we started to hit pressures on the NHS again because of the winter flu crisis, because of respiratory illnesses being on the rise and we've been pushing the government to do more. My general sense is that people are desperate for Christmas like I am. In parts of the country like mine, you know, in Leicester, in the northwest of England, we were in almost permanent lockdown for a year last year. This time last year we weren't partying, we were sitting wondering when we were going to see our families again. Some people have not spent Christmas with their elderly parents for two years now. And so we've got to do everything that it takes in order to make sure that we get Christmas. But my feeling is that while the public are doing our bit, the government just simply aren't doing theirs. Chris Hobson, how bad is it going to get, do you think? Is another lockdown inevitable? I think it's very difficult to tell at this point. I mean, we know what we do know about um, the Omicron variant is the fact that it is um, uh, particularly infectious. We know it's going to uh, the level of infections is going to go a lot faster um, than the Delta variant, and we're already seeing that, for example, in London. The bit that we just don't know, which is what makes the question particularly difficult at this very precise point in time, is really uh, what the level of hospitalizations and what the level of uh, mortality might be. And how and worried are you? Um, well, given the state of the NHS at the moment in terms of the amount of pressure that we're under before we've even got to um, this, this, this peak, we are the busiest we've ever been um, at this time of year. Uh, we've got very, very busy urgent and emergency care pathway. We're trying to get through all of those care backlogs. We're trying to do um, the booster campaign. Our colleagues in social care are under real, real pressure. So I think there is a real worry that were we to see the worst, um, worst case scenario take place, we would come under a very significant degree of pressure. But, Fiona, don't forget that we created those 34,000 beds right at the beginning of the, uh, of, of the pandemic, and we did an amazing job in terms of January 2021 when we had 40,000 simultaneously hospitalised COVID patients. So that's the great thing about the NHS, is that we can expand our capacity as needed, but it could be really quite difficult. Woman at the back in the red sweater. I think the biggest problem at the moment is the, um, the, diff the mess mixed messaging from the government. Um, obviously, you've got the chief medical um, advisor saying one thing and the government saying clearly another. And they're not taking, the government are definitely not taking the lead. And when I speak to friends and colleagues, I believe that the, the public have got um, more sensible than the government that's supposed to be leading us and showing us the right way. Chris? 
Well, to answer the question, no, I don't think a lockdown is inevitable. And the reason we're taking these steps is to do everything possible to try and avoid that eventuality. Um, just to take on Lisa's point first about... Well, why, we... tell you, why do you take that lady's point well, look, okay, first? Look, mixed I, I, messaging I think... and the people being more sensible well, than the government. First of all, I mean, I don't accept there's mixed messaging. I think the Prime Minister and Chris Whitty yesterday in the press conference were singing on the same hymn sheet. Well, lots they of were... your Conservative MPs do not think that. I mean, you know the Conservative leader Joy Morrissey, said um, perhaps the unelected COVID public health spokesperson, Chris Whitty, should defer to what our elected members of Parliament have decided... This is not a public health socialist state, she well, said. And look, I think she's now deleted that tweet, rightly. And, you know, they, they make the... She's the not the only one the who's, who's been complaining about same. Chris Whitty. The message is the same. Be careful and be cautious. But in terms of the, the steps that have been taken, you know, the booster rollout is, is leading Europe. We've now crossed 25 million people who've received the booster jab. Uh, yesterday, we got up to three quarters of a million booster jabs administered. That's doubled in more than a week. And our testing programme is also leading Europe. We've done 400 million tests and by the weekend we'll have capacity to post out a million a day and pharmacies will have capacity to deliver 10 million a week. So these are, these are measures that are leading Europe and by taking these steps we can minimise, not eliminate because as Chris said there are still many unknowns, but by taking these steps we can reduce okay. the chance of a further lockdown. And I'd like to finish Fiona by saying a huge thank you to the tens of thousands of volunteers who are making this booster programme possible. There's one lady that was on TV in Ramsgate early today who has personally delivered 15,000 jabs this year. So I think we should say just a huge thank you to those volunteers who are making this possible. Okay. Let's hear a bit more. The woman there in the black. You're waving at me, so let's hear from you. Hello. Yes, I th I, to uh, respond to the question, is lockdown inevitable? One of my concerns is, is that we're losing sight of all the other things that we should be talking about uh, in terms of what's going through Parliament at the moment, which are very important to a lot of people as well. And I, I, I refer to uh, the Police and Crime and Evidence Bill for one. There's many more than that, and the, term, the, uh, the points that are in, in those bills uh, are... So you think we're focusing too much on, on COVID? We, we, okay. we, we need to discuss those other points as well. They're very important to a large number of people in society. Oh, okay. Yes. And let's hear from the woman here. It just Yes, the woman there. Why have we not, um, as a minimum, at least brought back essential mask wearing in all indoor spaces and social distancing. Stuart. Um, if I pick up a Sheikh's question first, no, I don't think a lockdown is inevitable, but, and it's a very, very big but, we've had 11 million cases of COVID in the UK, 147,000 deaths, and a record 78,000 cases, I think, recorded yesterday. My real fear is that we may have to take very serious steps, even if it's short of a lockdown, and notwithstanding money that may have been made available or purported to be made available, the fact that we're without a furlough scheme or something like it uh, for people who are forced to self-isolate, for the businesses who can't operate because their customer base falls away because people are frightened, we need to get that step right, and I don't think we are. But also in terms of the mixed messaging, I mean, Chris has said the Chief Medical Officer and the Prime Minister were on the same page yesterday. I very much welcome that. The problem is, when one sees photographs of Tory staffers having parties, because it's one rule for you and a different rule for them, the mixed message couldn't be more stark. And Stuart, coming to the woman's point about... Uh, to your point, madam, about wearing masks, uh, that we should have continued wearing masks. Obviously, in Scotland, Mask wearing has continued. Yes, it has. It hasn't had a dramatic effect on cases, as far as one can tell. Well, the, the case levels are lower, fortunately. But they uh, haven't gone down as well. No, they haven't gone wearing. down. And the problem we have, I think all of us will share, is the Omicron uh, variant, massively transmissible, uh, even if the numbers who get very sick are small. A small percentage of a big number still puts huge, huge pressure uh, on the NHS. So all that can be done in terms of mask wearing, social distancing, hand washing should be done. That's just common sense. The man at the back. Uh, I'm a woman. I'm so sorry, because you've got your mask on, I couldn't see. Plus, I'm a bit short-sighted, so That's forgive okay, me. fair enough. Um, I'm just thinking that I think the situation's going to replicate in the future. 
unless we actually make sure that the rest of the world, especially in poorer countries, they get the jab because obviously the Omicron, Omicron variant has mutated in another country and come across this country. And basically the rich countries should be getting together and making sure that other countries are vaccinated as well en masse. Thank you. <laughs> now the back then. <clears throat> You've spoken about leading Europe, but you haven't spoken about leading Europe in terms of cases throughout the entire, um, well, as, as long as I can remember the figures. Um, we've led Europe in the amount we've spent on a test and trace system, but unfortunately we're not leading on how successful it's been. And I agree with the messages about mixed messaging. A lot of people that I know find COVID as an inconvenience rather than something to actually be worried about. And I think that is due to the mixed messaging of the government. We don't know where the cases are coming from because nobody's bothered about track and trace because you know, we have to wear masks, we don't have to wear masks, there's red list countries, there isn't red list countries. You know, I think everyone's fed up with it. So your track and trace system doesn't work. We don't know where the cases are coming from. We don't know where positive people are going to and spreading it. So how can you possibly hope to have any control over it? And you talk about mixed messaging. Are you clear what you should and should not be doing over Christmas? Um, well, not really. I think that's, it's probably gonna change at least three or four times before I actually sit down to eat my Christmas dinner and who I end up eating it with. We'll see. <laughs> Olivia. Well, I think where we get into the mixed messaging is basically that there's too much messaging from the government. I think that the lady in the red jumper had it absolutely right. People are more sensible than the government. And if we are told what our level of risk is, told how many cases are in our areas, we can make sensible choices off the back of that. Um, no, I don't think the lockdown is inevitable and I don't think a lockdown should ever be inevitable. We know that the, the damage that lockdown does, we, we've seen the mental health epidemic, we've seen what happens to, to deprive children. Um, I think it's now got to all be about teaching us about our own personal level of risk and letting us manage that. And, and so what should we be doing, Olivia? That. What, what should we be doing? Any restrictions? Right now, what I, I think, I mean, I think there's a very strong case that uh, Omicron is now spreading so fast that the restrictions that we've got in place at the moment are, are basically tinkering around the edges and masks aren't really going to do much if it's doubling every, every two to three days. Um, there are quite a lot of statisticians are suggesting that it's going to peak over the next two weeks even. So I think there's quite a strong argument for ad heavily advising vulnerable people to, to stay inside as much as they can until Christmas. Um, and, and, and the rest of us, what should we be doing? managing our own personal level of risk. I'm personally not seeing anyone over 50 in the next few weeks. I'm not seeing anyone vulnerable. I've been double jabbed. Obviously, you're not including me in that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm not at high risk from COVID, nor, nor is anyone I know. So I will <clears throat> go on leading my life. And I think that what, we should all be and, and the rest of free to do that. I mean, I'll think about who I'm going to see, what I'm doing. I, I, I think we're all doing it already. I think that's what's quite interesting. I don't think we need this big government response anymore. I'm seeing already, you know, friend messaged me tonight saying, I've got a bit of a cold. Um, I do keep testing negative, but I'm a bit worried. If you want to come around tomorrow, then, then do. But a, a few people have, have, cut out, have, have decided to not come. So make up your own mind. And I think that's a really healthy way to be addressing the situation. And we're all doing it every day ourselves. I don't think we need the government to have this really heavy hand of the state. I think people are more sensible than the government. Okay. I think we should be really, really clear. There would be tens of thousands, if not, you know, more than that, of people who, who would no longer be with us had we not done what we did in the first phase of the pandemic. And I think that is really important to remember. I think that the issue now is that the vaccines uh, as long as they remain effective, have actually changed the rules of the game. And I do think it makes, in a sense, this debate more complicated, because when you look back in those very early days, it seemed to me that the argument for social distancing, because it was the only thing that we could do to prevent the spread of this virus, it seemed to me the argument was pretty obvious and overwhelming. So what I do you think, think of Olivia's argument that we should be making our own decisions about what we should be doing? Well, I, I, I agree, by the way, that the jabs it, are what changes everything. Yes, yeah, but, and, and so, so I, I'm very clear that I think the government does need to give us clear guidance about what we should be doing. And, I, and, and I'm sorry, Chris, I, I, do, I do think if you just need to read today's headlines where effectively you've got, you know, the Prime Minister in one place and Chris Whitty in another. And, you know, that, that's what the newspapers have kind of, you know, consistently focused on today. And I do think it's really important that we get clear and consistent messaging right the way across both our scientific advisors, our medical advisors, but also government ministers, because that, that, is, that is what needs to be done. Just one more thing, Fiona, which is that... Um, 
the, the bit that I do think is important, and, and we all need to recognise, is, is that no, no guidance can, can actually tell us exactly what to do. There is a, an element of personal judgement that we will all need to exercise, and I think it is a fool's errand to pretend that you can get to a level of detail that will tell everybody what to do. We all have to exercise a degree of personal responsibility. The man here in the red sweater. <laughs> Isn't the reality the, the situation that the, the figures are so frightening now, the government dare not tell us just how bad this is going to get? Well, I think the government um, is and continues to be extremely transparent. All of the numbers get published daily so people can draw their own conclusions. And I think, look, just to come back to these points about the current measures, I think they, and I voted for them, Lisa voted for them as well a few days ago. They passed by a large majority because they are proportionate and balanced. They represent the kind of minimum sensible steps you would take in these circumstances. Wearing masks in crowded public places, working from home if you can, and either get, uh, being vaccinated or getting a lateral flow test if you're going to a large venue. And obviously that, are, that measure had to be voted through with Labour support. Those are the, well, it would have still passed even if Labour had abstained, but I'm glad they supported it, it was the right thing to do. Um, those are the minimum sensible measures that you should take. Beyond that, um, people can exercise discretion, but both the Prime Minister and Chris Whitty, if you look at what they said, rather than how the media reported it, if you look at what they actually said in that press conference, standing next to one another yesterday evening, they said the same thing. Which is okay, well, let's, let's look at what they said, Chris. Cautious. So the Prime Minister said people should think carefully before you go to pubs and restaurants, but, but, but absolutely said don't cancel parties. Chris Whitty said don't mix with people you don't have to for either work or family things that really matter to you. Yeah, look, the, the messaging is the same, which is be cautious and exercise judgment. It's pretty clear. So why do you think people are laughing at you saying that? That well, the messaging is the same? I mean, why you can, do you think you can, people are laughing? You can try and pass the language, but the fundamental point is well, people it, can exercise it's just their about judgment, what they but just be cautious. <laughs> well, if it's, not, okay. if it's not about language and what people say, what is it about? OK, let's, there's lots of people laughing. Let's hear from some of them. Uh, the man in the purple sweater. Uh, people are laughing because you're clowns. Uh, you said the minimum sensible measure twice and a hundred of your MPs voted against it. What does that say about them? Is that not a mixed message? Going into Parliament without masks, is that not a mixed message? You have to be told to put masks on. That, what do we do? We see that. We see you as the Christmas party. You're clowns. That's it. Yeah, well, if you walk into Parliament yesterday, you will have seen... If you, if you walked into Parliament yesterday, or in, today, I was in Parliament today, Everybody in there was wearing masks, quite rightly. And as far as the people who voted against the measures are concerned, look, it passed with a huge majority. Lisa and I both voted for it. I think the people that voted against it, as they see these figures going up, you know, might regret the way they voted. But it passed with an overwhelming majority, as it should have done. The man in the blue sweater. Is there a level or a threshold where we're going to say that we've got to do a lockdown, like number of people going into hospital, number of people dying through this Omicron variant? Is there a level where we're saying... There has to be a lockdown now. OK, I'll come back to that. Yes, the woman here in the green dress. Since the pandemic started, um, every day we've had the figures. Yesterday it was 78,000 people tested positive. Why do we never know how many people were actually tested and how many people are negative? Why are we only ever told who tests positive? We have the, the figure for how many people tested it does exist. I mean, we've got 88,000 uh, new infections today. What that does not include is reinfections. But I gather that information is going to be included in the future. So I, I take your point. The man here in the blue sweater. Yeah, I think that the timing of the announcement um, has literally crippled the hospitality industry, the sector overnight. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I, think, I think it's really naive of, of how you've handled the situation. And there's people, and there's people livelihoods overnight, which are going to be ruined. Do you work in hospitality? No, I don't, but I know people who do, and it's ill thought through. And what they've done, because the furlough scheme's not up and running, so they've got no dependency yet. And what you've done, literally overnight, is put people out of jobs. Okay. And the woman in the, in the back, at the, in the corner. Just uh, a comment and then a question, please. Um, as an interpreter, I'm always astonished at how the same message can be interpreted mm. so differently. Mm between people, as I think we've just seen evidence of a minute ago. Um, I'd just like to comment that Professor Whitty, when asked a year ago by somebody what they should do is they'd just pack their suitcase for Christmas, his response was, unpack, and that was the end of the question. 
Boris Johnson, on the other hand, has a fantastic amount to say, and as far as I can make out, with very little substance. So perhaps Professor Whitty should move into number 10. Um, but uh, in any case, I'm not getting the messages from Boris Johnson. Um, and my question is, if vaccination is um, seen to be the major way forward through this and the safest way to work our way through the current variant, is there an argument that people who have um, deliberately chosen not to be vaccinated should not be allowed to roam very far from their residence this Christmas? Thank you. OK. Well, listen, let's come to one of the questions asked earlier. Chris, I'm going to ask you this. Uh, a level at which a level of, of deaths or hospitalisations which are locked down is, has to happen. I mean, the NHS can cope with, correct me if I'm wrong, about 4,000 admissions a day. Something in, in that region, well, isn't it? Well, the, the 4,000 figure is sort of something that's come into the public consciousness over the last few days, and I don't think many of us in the NHS recognise it. Okay, it, 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 it is a I reflection... I thought Chris would you refer to it yesterday. Okay, okay. well, it, it is a reflection of um, the level of um, uh, um, uh, uh, new admissions that we had in hospitals at the January peak. The problem with just focusing on the COVID casework is that it doesn't recognise, firstly, what's going on in the rest of the NHS, uh, in terms of the amount of pressure we're under. And the second thing it doesn't recognise, which is the bit that is going to really come up and give us a major problem, is the number of staff that we're going to have off because of the fact that they've caught COVID. And as you and everybody in this audience well knows, we've got a really important duty to protect everybody who is in a healthcare setting. Staff, uh, patients, many of whom are vulnerable, and their visitors. And what is going to happen is that, given the speed with which um, Omicron is going to go through the, you know, um, the infection rate, we're going to find lots, significant numbers of our staff are actually not going to be able to be at work. And, and it's really the combination of those two things right. that's going to make life particularly difficult. So what, what, what we're saying really clearly is um, we still don't know how serious it's going to be, so we can't say for sure we need those tougher measures, but, so, no, we, but, we, but we need to be ready to introduce them as yes, soon as Yes, you've made that point, thank clear. you. And, and Stuart, in Scotland, coming to the question of is there a point at which a lockdown is inevitable, mm. be it the number of cases admitted to hospital, number of infections, have you got a number in mind? No, the, it's not a number, it's the balance between the number of people who are becoming seriously ill and requiring to go to hospital, and as we've just heard, the number of staff who are available to treat them. So this is not going to be a fixed number. It's going to have to be slightly subjective. It's going to have to be looked at on a day by day and hour by hour. And do you basis. think stricter measures are going to be brought, brought in? Well, I'm not sure if they're, they're definitely going to be brought in. I think what I would say is vaccination is the best tool in the armory. That's self-evidently the case. But the seriousness and immediacy of Omicron means that we need to prepare to take the necessary steps to keep people safe and alive. And this really goes back to the question about hospitality. The decisions being taken in Scotland and indeed throughout the UK in order to have mask wearing, hand washing, social distancing, avoiding choke points where people can congregate, these measures are not designed to shut hospitality down. These measures are designed to keep hospitality open. Nobody wants that bit of the economy to struggle. But the, bu the public health balance has to come first. All right. I'm going to take another question. Before I do, I'm just going to cast ahead to after Christmas, uh, because this is our last programme before Christmas. Two dates to your diary, then. January the 13th will be in Shrewsbury. And the following week on January the 20th, we'll be in St Andrews in Fife. So do come and join the audience. Let's cast, you know, who knows what it'll be like. But do come and join the audience uh, if you live in either uh, of those places, so Shrewsbury or St Andrews, and you can apply by going to the Question Time website and come and be part of the programme. We would love to see you. So that is after Christmas. OK, let me tell you what we're going to go to next. We are going to Cathy, Cathy Brereton. Ah, oh, there you Hi. are. How have we gone from a world-beating vaccination rollout to what I see as a chaotic shambles of a booster programme? So, and so why do you see it as a chaotic yeah, shambles? Yeah, so I'm sorry to kind of already... I know it's been partly answered on the panel, and I think um, the government have been very self-congratulating on the numbers that they're getting through. But I didn't think that a week before Christmas that some of the most vulnerable people have not been vaccinated. They've not had the booster yet. They've not had the third jab. And um, are you talking from personal experience? 
Uh, my husband in particular, he's um, immunity suppressed. His uh, booster was cancelled this week, totally out of the blue. And um, because th there was the change in policy and over 18s had been invited, it doesn't look like he can actually get his booster until the new year, unless he wants to attend one of Boris Johnson's jabathons at a football stadium, which is not what, you know, how is this okay a week before Christmas? You know, some of the most elderly, some of the most vulnerable, people who can't get out of the homes. And I do think that the government are just using numbers for numbers sake by getting as many young people through the door, but it's not okay. Okay, Cathy, I will answer your question. Lots of hands shot up, you are shot up, so I just want to hear what you had to say. I'm just wondering if, in answer to that, if one of the issues is the time frame that was given between the announcement that was made on Sunday with um, a very ambitious timeline of by the end of the month, what, what we wanted in that time frame. I wonder, was that ever possible? You want to come in, don't you, Chris? Well, I can see you <laughs> shaking your head, but I mean, this is Cathy's experience, Look, that her husband needs a jab and can't yeah, get one. Yeah, and, and, and Cathy, clearly, um, that's a real kind of cause of concern because um, we've been very, very clear in the NHS that, that what, what we must do first is ensure that all of those people who need a booster for particular reasons, like the immunosuppressed, like those who are particularly vulnerable, they must be the priority. And the letter that went out, uh, and I know because I was talking to five chief executives this morning, they're working um, of different, in, right the way across the country, we're working really, really hard to make sure that that happens. So, but um, there's no consolation to say we've been very clear we sent out a letter. No, Kathy's no, 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 husband no, no, I, I, no I, I kind of recognise that. And, and I'm saying, you know, I mean, obviously, <laughs> I, I can't answer for each individual your case but we are very clear that that is the top priority and it's been made very clear that it's the top priority um, we are working incredibly hard to, and very very quickly to try and uh, extend the booster program as quickly as possible so um, today uh, yesterday's figures we actually were 87 percent more um, boosters were given yesterday compared to the previous Wednesday we're actually ramping up capacity very very quickly but your point I thought was a really good one which is we, we're having to do do that at incredible pace and you know I, again um, I can't tell you how hard NHS staff and NHS managers and our colleagues in local government and wider public services are working at real real pace to kind of get this going as quickly um, as possible and some extraordinary things are kind of being done in terms of the speed at which we're moving and you know, I really am sorry. I can only apologise if there's been a, you know, there are individual instances where, because we're trying to ramp up capacity as quickly as possible, people who should have been given priority um, haven't been. Olivia. Um, to be fair to the government, I, I thought the boost programme was going pretty well, but, but I do completely appreciate Cathy's point, and I agree that. I think that the focus has been wrong with these jabs. Um, the third jab is obviously incredibly important for vulnerable people, uh, but it's not particularly important to someone like me, a healthy 28-year-old. Um, and I think it's completely wrong if those jabs uh, aren't being used on your husband. And, and I was able to get my, my third jab today. And I think this ties into the point the lady made at the back of there as well. Uh, we've, been, we've been sort of stockpiling these jabs. We've been doing this in the West far too much. And there are lots of other countries where really vulnerable people haven't been jabbed once and here we are getting our third jabs I also think that you know the fact that my jab was using precious NHS time which could have been used for someone's cancer appointment um, is not good and doesn't really speak well for, for, for where we are as a society and I think Cathy you're absolutely right that it seems to be numbers for numbers sake and sort of getting young people in the doors uh, for the sake of it and, and it feels like sort of an air of desperation and panic which which probably isn't really necessary women there in the glasses we keep talking about the boosters, but <laughs> nobody seems to be mentioning the fact that we've still got, is it about 20, 25% of people unvaccinated completely. What do we do about those? Surely they're causing... And you're, call, you're, you're counting young children in that, are you? Um, no, not necessarily. I, I'm looking at the, the adult figure that I read in one of yeah. the newspapers. Um, it's about 20, 25% that haven't been vaccinated at all. OK, the man here. Well, I think vaccines are the answer. They are the answer, there's no doubt about it. Um, Tobias Elwood the other day was uh, reporting on television. He said we should have a, 
we should have by now, because we've been with this nearly t two years, we should have a uh, task force to deal purely with COVID, to take the pressure off the NHS. But yet again, I wrote to Boris, and you may think I'm a Labour voter by saying this, but I wrote to Boris on the 21st of October and said, throw the kitchen sink at these, and yet again, asleep on the job. And I've, uh, the, the other thing I suggest is that maybe we should maybe scrap that white elephant HS2, which is going to be half mothballed anyway, and let's use the 150 billion to get that task force out there and let's safeguard the country and let's save our licensees, let's save our retail trade and get this country back up in the, in the right direction. Conservatives, please. Right, so <laughs> you've got two things there. So chaotic shambles of a booster programme uh, and why use the money? Why not use more money on, on that rather than spending it on HS2? Yeah, look, starting with the booster programme, and I'd echo what Chris said. I'm really sorry if your husband has had a bad experience. As the booster programme was rolled out, just like the original vaccines, older people and vulnerable people uh, were quite rightly prioritised. Uh, what is happening now is we're rolling out as quickly as The difficulty as we... has been with people who can't leave their homes, hasn't it? Yeah, well, and I know, know there have been some GPs who have been going to people's homes, visiting them yeah. to administer the vaccine. Chris is nodding. So a lot of things have been done to look after those people who can't leave their homes. But the reason the wide rollout is now so important, why it's so urgent, is we need to effectively beat this new variant before it, before it spreads. And the way we can do that, as I think almost everyone has acknowledged, is by vaccinating quickly. And do you those, think you could have acted more quickly when it was first announced? It was almost three weeks ago the accelerated booster programme was announced. It got off to a slightly sluggish start. I mean, the, the first weekend was offering less, fewer vaccinations than the weekend mm. prior. Do you think you could have got off to a faster start? Well, I, I think even before the new variant became widely understood, uh, we had only done sort of 17 or 18 million booster jabs by then already. So the booster programme had been running very effectively throughout the autumn. Again, Chris, Chris Hobson from the NHS Confederation uh, is nodding. It's now really accelerated. It's almost doubled in the last week. And if we can get uh, almost the entire uh, population vaccinated or at least offered the opportunity to vaccinate in the next couple of weeks, it means we can get life back to normal as soon as possible. It means we can protect the health of vulnerable people who might otherwise catch the disease from someone who's otherwise um, relatively healthy, like younger people, um, like you, know, you were saying earlier, uh, that very same point. You know, by, by vaccinating younger people, we are protecting the whole population. We're also protecting the economy. Now, the, more, the sooner we can get back to normal, the more we protect the economy. Um, we have put money into doing that. Somebody made a point about jobs earlier. Unemployment is now down to the uh, almost record low level. Employment, uh, payroll employment, is higher now than it was before coronavirus We're getting quite happened. far off, Chris, because forgive me. Because this, you're getting quite it. far off the question, which is about a chaotic shambles of a booster programme, not, not, not employment not generally. Shambles. Stuart. Yeah, uh, the, Kathy's question, I, I think there's a lot of merit in what you've said. First of all, this is not a world-beating inoculation programme or anything close to it. And you had a few problems in Scotland, didn't well, you, we, to begin we, with? We, listen, with a big rollout like this with millions and millions, tens of millions of people, of course there are going to be issues. But I think, looking at the figures most recently, we're about 75% plus now double jagged. That's good. I think in Scotland we're about 50% with the third or booster jag. From what Chris has just said, it sounds like it's broadly the same in England. My concern, and this was in the Evening Standard last week, there are some London boroughs with over 100,000 people who haven't had a single vaccination. There's a real problem getting to those people who, for whatever reason, have chosen not to be vaccinated. Now, you, know, you can't drag people to a centre and stick a needle in their arm, but more action quite clearly needs to be taken for those who have been resistant or unable to get vaccinated so far. Yes, go on here in the picture. Hello, um, I work in the, for the NHS, but I'm community-based. I'm not in the hospital. <clears throat> and the talk about the extra bodies we need. A lot of the nurses that I work with actually go around the centres vaccinating, as well as holding their own jobs down. But in the community, um, it's come so far away from what we've done for years. It's more important now to have laptops, iPads, phones. That comes first now, and that's a smarter way of working. They don't change catheters and do dressings and look after palliative people at night. It's just a couple of bodies that are on duties for big areas. 
So we've come so far away from what it means to look after people in the community without being hit by this virus now as well on top. Lisa. In fact, his question was, have we gone from a world-beating vaccination rollout to a chaotic shambles of a booster programme? I, I think it's the right question, but I am enormously proud of the people, the NHS workers, the volunteers, the council workers, the armed forces, who've gone out and delivered this booster programme. To listen to Chris, you'd think that they, the Tory government had been personally jabbing people in arms up and down this country. Well, they haven't. The credit for that lies with people who went into this crisis already in a weakened state. We had 10 years of cuts to the National Health Service and attacks on frontline pay, which we're still seeing now. We went into this with waiting lists in the National Health Service, and instead of complaining, people right up and down this country rolled up their sleeves and rolled out the first wave of the vaccination, but do you agree despite with everything Kathy's that had been with, thrown at them. I'm not, I'm not suggesting... Well, Cathy, I, I'm assuming you're, you're not meaning any disrespect, disrespect no, I, to all I the people who volunteered or arrested it. Moment, but nonetheless, Cathy's suggesting, she was, but, suggesting it's a chaotic shambles of a booster but look, programme. But, but, Fiona, this is the, the website Fiona, crashed, Fiona, people couldn't get lateral flow tests, that kind of But this is the point. They are exhausted. I went down to get my booster jab a few weeks ago and they're losing volunteers because the volunteers are absolutely wiped out. They're in the middle of the third wave of this and they've been at it without the resources and the capacity that they need. When places like Leicester and Bolton said to the government, we need extra capacity just to get the second jab rolled out, they were met with a brick wall and deaf ears. That should not be the case in the middle of a pandemic. And I'll tell you what the problem is. The problem is a prime minister and a government that are more interested in bluster and rhetoric and their own interests than the detail and the hard graft that it takes to get the country through a pandemic. Every single time, whether it's Afghanistan when the foreign secretary was on a beach, whether it's now when businesses are falling over and the chancellor is somewhere in California when he should be here working to keep our businesses going every single time this is a government that goes missing in action and it's just not good enough i'd like to take a question from andy hawkins good evening <clears throat> stoke on trent has lost coal steel and ceramic industries what would you suggest should be done to replace these jobs and encourage growth and prosperity in this once great city? And what's your view, Andy? Well, I think the, the country's too London-centred, and I think far more <laughs> government business should be conducted in other cities other than London. Um, we've seen what happened with Salford when Media, Media City uh, moved in a massive change. Well, let's do some more. Let's have some in Stoke-on-Trent. It's been robbed, this, this city. Absolutely robbed. It was a powerhouse for this country, and it's in tatters. If you want convincing, take a walk round the city centre. Stuart. It's hard for me to speak about Stoke particularly, but if we widen that out, we still need to invent things. We still need to design things. We still need to make things. I think it was George Osborne, a Tory Chancellor, who said, we need to manufacture in lieu of imports. There has never been a UK-wide industrial strategy put in place which actually delivers on that and your aspirations. So uh, let's start inventing, start designing, start building so that the IP we create, our businesses and universities create, doesn't end up being made into products halfway around the world and all the profit and all the skills and all the expertise goes with it. Now, bits of this are happening in every part of the UK. There's all sorts of institutes and thinking going on. But there needs to be an effort by the UK government to have an industrial strategy, not just a London-centric business strategy, not just a banker strategy, but an industrial strategy that actually returns the value to places like Stoke and places like Dundee that we've lost over many decades. 
Chris, what should be done to replace the jobs that have been lost from coal, steels, the ceramic industries to encourage growth and prosperity in Stoke-on-Trent? Yeah, look, I think it's a very fair question. I think, mean, first of all, there's, there's money being put into cities like Stoke. So, for example, Stoke is getting £56 million in levelling up funding for the town centre regeneration and the Swift House Goods Yard project. Uh, there are 550 home office jobs being located to Stoke-on-Trent. £18 million uh, for the Kidsgrove Town deal to reopen the leisure centre that the Labour Council shut down and lots of other investments in Stoke-on-Trent as well. 140 extra police coming to Staffordshire. So, so those, those briefing notes have come in handy, haven't they, those Chris? All, I see you reading well, right I think there's nothing, out there. There is nothing wrong, Fiona, with a bit of preparation. So those things are all coming to Stoke-on-Trent. But there is a broader question as well. And I actually agree with what Andy, uh, with Stuart, sorry, um, said just a moment ago. We need to regenerate and rejuvenate our manufacturing industries, but also in technology, which is an area that, that we look after at DCMS. We are developing a digital strategy. We want to get people skills that can enable them to participate in growth industries. Uh, we've got digital skills partnerships. We're investing in education. Uh, tech jobs are the jobs of the future, and we want to make sure they are created across the whole UK, including Stoke-on-Trent, so that as we grow uh, new uh, digital uh, companies, uh, the benefit is felt across the entire United Kingdom. It's something we are completely committed to, and places like Stoke-on-Trent are exactly the kind of places we need to encourage growth and new industries to flourish in. Woman there in the white top. Uh, hi. Um, just wanted to say, with in terms of levelling up, this city is incredible. We've got some amazing people in this city. When people visit, that's one of the things that they say, is that everyone's so friendly and comes together. And we have so many great things in this city. We have two fantastic universities, science parks. You know, why are we not investing in training people and levelling people up so that the people of the city can access the jobs made? There's no point pulling in however many jobs for people where there aren't the people in the city qualified to take it. We need to be investing in us, investing in our people. And, you know, Stoke's even brilliantly situated. You know, we're a few hours from Manchester, a few hours from Birmingham, a few hours from London. That's without HS2. That's just with our normal rail. You know, you can throw as much money at this city as you like, but if the people of this city aren't benefiting from it, then there's very little point. Mm -hmm. there in the white yeah. Hello. Um, I just want to echo basically what the ladies said previously. I think a lot of the time it's Londoners who are making the decisions about what happens in places like Stoke, and I don't think it's right. I think we know what's best for our city, and I think that the government should be coming back to us and asking what we want and what we need, rather than throwing money at things that are completely unnecessary. Yeah. Yes, you. And my concern is that although... We live in an absolute wonderful area and everybody would say and visitors comment on it like this lady said here we do have a serious problem with uh, air pollution um, coming from our local landfill site and that's going to have major implications for any kind of major investment in this area until that's resolved lisa i mean i think this conversation has already highlighted the problem with the levelling up agenda and also the solution that you've got a government minister who comes to Stoke to read off a list of things that the government has given, handed down to the people of Stoke in order to make things better and you've got people in the audience who know exactly what needs to be done in order to attract <coughs> investment and unleash the potential in this area in order to make sure that those young people who grow up here don't just see that there are great jobs here but that they can get those jobs and that they can get those opportunities and that no longer do young people have to get out in order to get on. The situation facing Stoke is, is really similar to the situation facing my town in Wigan, in Barnsley and right across this country where within living memory we powered the world, we built this country's wealth and influence and we made a contribution and we could do that again so if what we exactly had a government would you that do, matched Lisa? the level of ambition that we have for our own community. So what would you do? Would you have what, town hall meetings? What are you suggesting Let, in order to Power to and resources have to move out of Whitehall and Westminster. That is the only way that you start to deliver on the ambition what, a local that mayor? people have is that what you're for suggesting? their countries. Let me, let me give you an example, right? Chris mentioned, Chris mentioned digital and technology. 
Well, nearly 90% of digital jobs in recent years that have been created have gone to London and the South East. Why is that the case? It's the case because we don't have the inf investment in infrastructure that we deserve in other parts of this country. The digital infrastructure, the transport infrastructure, the investment in skills that that lady talks about. And the only way, I've been banging on about this for over a decade, and frankly, the only way that this is going to be delivered upon is when the government finally accepts that they can stop handing out small pots of money to a favoured few from Whitehall and hand over the power and resources to local areas in order to invest ourselves in the things that we know and have known for years we need and we deserve. Come back there in the check dress. No, the woman in the check dress. Um, I agree entirely with Lisa. Um, we do need more diversity in the city of Stoke-on-Trent, but I was especially encouraged last week when I heard on local radio uh, and one of the councillors had acknowledged that they'd recently uh, observed that um, pottery that was used in the council chambers, in the town hall, very much locally by uh, the council, uh, was not made in Stoke-on-Trent. And she actually acknowledged that they would be looking at that seriously and rectifying that issue, which I think is great for Stoke-on-Trent. Of course, this area has been famous for ceramics since what, since the 17th century. Uh, Olivia. Um, I mean, I think, I think that the point that Lisa made, actually, and, and the man over here, that, that we should be giving more power to the people makes a lot of sense. And I think the problem with the levelling up strategy is that it, could, it can become sort of spending money for the sake of it. Tory ministers sort of reeling off how much money they sent, spent as though the money in itself is a good thing. And that's not true. As, as you're saying, it's got to be spent wisely and invested in, in training, in education, um, etc. I also think that, you know, where the government can play a really important role here is... You know, Brexit, lots of people here voted for Brexit and the idea, a big part of Brexit was we're able to make our own rules, we're able to, to pull down barriers to trading with the rest of the world so that the wonderful ceramics that are made in Stoke on Trent can be more easily, you know, sold and shared and traded across the entire world. And, you know, that's, that's the sort of opportunity that we should be seizing um, in the months ahead. So can I just come back on this idea that the, the investment in Stoke on Trent is somehow ineffective. I mean, this was called for by the three new Conservative MPs for the three Stoke seats. Labour uh, had MPs in Stoke for decades and decades. There was a Labour government before that. They didn't invest any of this money. Your new local MPs, elected by you in Stoke-on-Trent, the three of them, argued the case for investment in Stoke-on-Trent in things like infrastructure, in skills, in reopening a leisure centre, and the government listened and responded. That is democracy in action with your new three MPs fighting for this investment, securing this investment, and it is doing exactly the things you're asking for. Skills, infrastructure, regeneration, for the benefit of the whole Stoke-on-Trent area. I think this is an example of a success Chris, story in action. will you listen to yourself? We're doing the things you asked for. This is not your money. This is our money. This is our money that we should be, have the right to decide how it's invested. You know, we've had High Speed 2 come up quite a few times tonight. Now, I am a supporter of High Speed 2. I think, on balance, it will be better for us than not. But if you had given people in the Midlands and the North to make the right about transport decisions in their own areas, I tell you, we would not have started with High Speed 2. We would have started with connecting up our great towns and cities across the North of England and investing in buses, which is where most people are. Those projects are happening as the well. The arrogance is just incredible. It's a, an idea that you can sit drawing lines on a map of train routes and bus routes to places that you've never visited, and lives you will never know. And this is the difference. When you cancel those train, that train investment, when you draw those lines on a map about bus routes, I tell you what you're doing, you're cancelling out people's opportunities to take up apprenticeships. You're stopping them from getting to see their grandparents. You are cutting off opportunities for people to even get home in time to read their kids a bedtime Lisa, story. As you, Lisa, it is unacceptable. Lisa, it's gone as on you, for too Lisa, long. As you well know, Stop with the arrogant Lisa, rhetoric from Whitehall. Lisa, it's not and start trusting Lisa, us to this... make decisions for ourselves. Lisa, the, the investment... 
is the investment in rail services. The investment in rail services being made is the, biggest, is the biggest in history. You've just cancelled it. In my area, you, you decided that you were taking away a lot of the investment. You said, we'll electrify your track, and then you took away the trains. I mean, are you kidding me? This is what happens when people sit in meeting rooms hundreds of miles away from people whose lives are affected and, and have the arrogance Catherine. to think they can make decisions that deeply affect the fabric of our lives, our kids' futures and our communities. Enough is enough. Can I, can I come back to you, Andy, and just basically say, would you mind if I bang the drum for the NHS? Because actually, interestingly... I think you've been if, doing that all program. Yeah, I, I was going to say... Carry on, <laughs> Fiona, because that's my job. Um, so You've done very well at that <laughs> so <laughs> far, but I'd like to take issue with... Hang on, let's take, Chris on, 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 we'll come back to you, Andy. Let's just and, let Chris so, answer so, the question. So, if you actually look at who's got a geographic footprint right the way across the country, who actually is the largest, one of the largest local employers in each town and city in this country... Where are we going to see the growth in jobs? A million new jobs needed in health and care over the next decade, according to the Health Foundation. Too often, I think, we see our National Health Service and our care system as a drain on taxpayers' money. But actually, if you see, there's a real opportunity to create good jobs, education and training, links to local colleges, apprenticeships. I think we should be thinking of the NHS as actually a fantastic means to level up places like Stoke-on-Trent and actually to ensure that we create the jobs that our young people need. Okay. Agreed, but... but the... <laughs> Sorry, I just want to speak to Andy behind you. Chris, the numbers that you were, you were talking about earlier, 50-odd million here, 50, a few million there, these are trifling sums. What's been going on in the London area? I mean, what did um, your uh, cross, new Cross London cross line rail. cost? That, cross rail. It's not even finished yet, and it's up to about 19 billion. If you'd have thrown 19 billion round up here, you'd have seen some difference. Not, not just a few million. A little bit here, a little bit there. And then, oh, we'll do another big project down in the London area. They can wait up north. Lisa, you're dead right, and I'm no Labour supporter, but you're bang on the money tonight, love. <laughs> on the net. In the blue top. Yes, you, madam. I think it's worth pointing out that if HS2 ever leaves Birmingham, it will bypass Stoke and go straight to Crewe. It's not coming to Stoke. What we really need here is a decent public transport system. If you've ever tried to get around this city, or even Newcastle, where I've come from, on a bus, oh, heaven help you. The man at the back in the black jacket. I just find it interesting that all we get from the Conservative member is sound bites and just things to listen to and figures to to try and memorise so that we can reel them off. Um, but then also Labour talking about listening to local people when I read about them actively moving around local candidates within local councils to ensure that the parliamentary party is getting who they want in and not who's already built up the relationship with the people. Who do you want me to choose? And the woman at the back in the, in the blue, yes. Um, as someone who was born and bred near Westminster and has spent the last 30 years based in Stoke, I can tell you that levelling up stops around the Watford Gap. And uh, when you come out at Stoke Station, you're pretty much looking at how you can get to where you want to go on the bus service. For those that don't know, Stoke-on-Trent consists of six different towns. There is very little connectivity. And as far as I'm concerned, and Lisa, I completely agree with what you were saying, until a huge investment of the cross-rail type size that this gentleman has just been talking about is made, people will not want to come and invest in Stoke-on-Trent. It will remain a distribution warehouse dumping ground between Manchester and Birmingham because there just isn't the, the reason. Why would you come to Stoke? I mean, yes, if you wanted to live somewhere on the basis of the goodness of the people... And you you're know, saying you're... this as someone from Stoke? Yeah, I live in Stoke. I've lived in Stoke for a long time. I'm not from Stoke, so I've seen both the, the Kensington-Chelsea angle and the Stoke-on-Trent angle. It's been a very split life, but I can tell you that London and Stoke are like two different countries, and they're only 160 miles apart. I just do not see any levelling up at all. And um, the investment needs to start with education, so that people here can even develop the concept of aspiration, let alone realise it, develop the concept. Thank you. I'm here in the purple sweater. Oh, actually, sorry, we've heard me. The, the lady back there in the, in the sorry, left. The yes, you've railed off all your statistics to us. 
our statistics are 50%, over 50% of our city is in the 20% most deprived in the country. And over a third of our city is in the 10% bottom category of the most deprived in the city, in the country, in uh, England. And what, what, so, do you, what do you think of what you're hearing tonight? I, I'm just, I'm horrified. I don't think there's any connection at all with the gentleman from the Conservative Party, with the people of Stoke-on-Trent. Lisa Nandy, I, am, I didn't vote Labour in the last election, I have to say, but I'd vote for you tonight because I think you're the only person who's connected with what we need in Stoke-on-Trent. The Conservative Party isn't at all connected. So, Chris, obviously that's just one view, but given that, that Stoke, which was a Labour stronghold, has now, as you pointed out, got three Conservative MPs, what do you make of what you're hearing? Because it's hardly a resounding welcome for your comments. Yeah, look, I mean, it's, um, look, I mean, Stoke-on-Trent was, was neglected for many, many years by the Labour Party, both locally um, now, and, made and that in point, But what about the point you're going to, look, your message doesn't, to the, to the people who are speaking yeah. anyway, your message doesn't so, appear to look, be cutting through. Cl clearly, clearly, look, clearly there, is, there, clearly there is huge investment needed to, for Stoke to fulfil its potential. As, as people have said here, it's a city with great people, it's a city which is well located, it's a place that has huge uh, opportunities for the future. But that does require investment to unlock it. And I know you've sort of laughed at the fact that I was reading off um, the figures that we've been investing, but those are important because it does, the truth is, it does take money and it does take investment to build infrastructure, to regenerate town centres and to invest in skills. I mean, you made the point yourself. We need, or, uh, and other people have as well, we need to invest in skills to make sure people can do the jobs of the future. So, and these are significant amounts of money. They've been fought for by your new Conservative MPs. They've been, and you said these are just sort of imposed from Whitehall, but that isn't true. They've been developed. These projects I've been talking about, like reopening the Leisure Centre, have been developed with the local council here in Stoke. It's done as a partnership. It's done together. Cutting people's wages. And I think, and I Chris, think, when you, but you've just, you've just heard the NHS, the NHS and social care is a really important Anderson. part of the economy here. And when you deny nurses the pay rise that they were promised, when you drive down terms, wages and conditions in the social care sector, what you're doing is sucking that. You've given them, you've given the people of Stoke a, a fiver, and then you've taken a tenner out of their back pocket. I mean, you're sucking okay. money okay. out of okay. them. Just, just to be clear, spending on the NHS, including... Hang on, just to be clear. Spending on the NHS, including in Stoke, is going up a great deal. So, Lisa, that just isn't true. We've got, true. we've got hardly you're any time left. Pen. I want to have one more response from the audience. Yes, the woman here, you've been sitting very patiently in the, in the green dress. OK, so you've mentioned that le leisure centre, goodness knows how many times. And the money that's been allocated to Stoke and the surrounding areas. So, how do you think we feel when it's reported in the local press that that money's been spent on a car park? Right. Okay. I don't know if you know about that specifically. I'd be surprised if you do. In that case, we will leave it there. Thank you very much for your contribution. Our hour is up. That's it for question time this side of Christmas. Thank you very much to the panel for coming this evening. Thank you very much to you sitting there asking all your questions. Mars on, Mars off. You've been absolutely brilliant. Thank you. And to you at home, thank you very much for watching. Have a very happy, healthy and safe Christmas from Question Time. Bye-bye. <laughs>